All right, everybody, welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. In this lesson, we are going to continue our discussion talking about paralytics, and we're going to get into talking about the actual neuromuscular blocking agents that we use. Before we get too far in, if you'd be interested in more of these critical care educational videos such as this one here, then I really invite you guys to subscribe to our channel below. When you do, hit that bell icon and select all notifications. This way, as soon as we release a new video, that you'll be notified right away. And as always, a special thank you to all of our awesome subscribers. You guys continue to support this channel by watching our videos, leaving us likes and comments. All that really goes a long way for us, and I really appreciate that, so I want to thank you. All right, so let's go ahead and get into our lesson. And my name is Eddie Watson, and this is ICU Advantage. All right, so in today's lesson, we're going to be talking about the different paralytics that we use. Like I talked about in the last lesson, we refer to these as our neuromuscular blockers. So our neuromuscular blocking agents are going to be the different medications that are at our disposal when we're needing to block that muscle contraction for our patients. I know when I was first starting out in the ICU, the paralytics were, were probably some of the medications that I felt the least comfortable with both in terms of exactly what they're doing and the doses that we deal with, primarily because it's not something that we do all that often. And typically, once we're moving to using these on our patients, they're usually pretty sick at that point. And so hopefully the goal is with this lesson here that by the end of this, you guys will have a better understanding of these different medications that we use and the doses that you're going to expect to see with them so that hopefully you guys will feel more comfortable. So now as we talk about the different neuromuscular blocking agents, there's two different classes of medications that we need to talk about. The first is what we call depolarizing, and the medications in this class are going to bind with those acetylcholine receptors. They're going to initially activate it, but then they're going to stay bound to that receptor, preventing our body's own acetylcholine from being able to continue to activate those receptors. So hopefully this makes sense after watching the previous video where we really talked about the anatomy and physiology and what's happening in that neuromuscular junction. Because as I said, this is where these medications are going to have their effect. If you haven't watched that lesson already, I am going to link to it up above and down in the, the lesson notes as well. But again, for this first class, the depolarizing agents think that they're going to bind to those receptors, causing it to initially activate but then they're going to stay bound, preventing future activation. And so then that leads us into our other class that we have, which is what we call non-depolarizing. And these ones you can probably figure out, but essentially they're going to bind again to the acetylcholine receptors, but they're not going to activate it once they bind, and they're going to continue to prevent future activations by our body's own acetylcholine. And so with those two class definitions out of the way, let's go ahead and jump in and start to talk about this first class of our depolarizing agents. So the nice thing about talking about the medications in this class here is we actually only have one medication that we use that's going to fall within this class. And that's a medication that we call succinylcholine, or you'll also hear it referred to as SUX. One of the great things about SUX is it's very short acting. It actually has an onset of about 60 seconds. And then after only four to five minutes, we're going to find our patients being able to breathe again. And after about 10 to 12 minutes, we're going to see complete reversal of this medication. And so because of all of this, this is actually our drug of choice for intubation. Because it has such a quick onset and a very relatively short period of action, this is ideal in these situations where we're going to need to get somebody paralyzed quickly, but then once the procedure is over, we really don't need them to be paralyzed anymore. And so SUX is one of our paralytics that we're going to use exclusively as a push dose. So you're not going to see this given as a continuous infusion. But given its popularity for intubation, this definitely is going to be a medication that you guys are going to come across. And some good info for you guys that it's good to know ahead of time is that when you give this medication, you might see some sort of fasciculation of their skeletal muscle, and this is coming from that initial activation when it binds to those receptors. Usually when we see this, though, it's just going to be some twitching 
very momentarily. And so now, if you've been in the ICU for more than a few minutes, you've probably realized that SUX isn't the only paralytic that we use for intubation. And we will get to talking about those other medications here in a minute, but you might be wondering, you know, this sounds like the perfect drug that we would want to use in this case. Why wouldn't everybody just use this? Well, unfortunately, since this medication is a depolarizing agent, there are some side effects that come along with it and some potentially life-threatening effects, especially in certain patients. One of the things to be aware of is that when giving this medication, that we can see an increase in our patient's serum potassium. And this is going to be a result of that systemic muscle contraction from that initial activation of those acetylcholine receptor sites. And so if you think back to that previous lesson, the way the action potential works, as well as the depolarizing events within our muscle cells, is we end up swapping sodium outside the cell and potassium inside the cell. And so this systemic muscle contraction ends up leading to a lot of potassium that leaves our cell, and some of that can leak into our patient's vasculature. And this ultimately can lead to a rise in their serum potassium levels. Now, this is just a transient rise as we will see things shift back, but you can probably see how this can potentially be problematic in some patients. Now, in particular, if we have patients who have burns, spinal cord injuries, and trauma with excessive skeletal muscle damage, that these patients are really going to be at risk for hyperkalemia. And the reason for this is that after time, these patients' bodies are going to have an upregulation of those acetylcholine receptors, and these receptors are also going to be activated by succicholine. And so now, because they have these large amounts of these receptors, we're going to have an even larger release of potassium, and thus leading to hyperkalemia. And in fact, in some cases, this can lead to potentially lethal arrhythmias. And having worked in a trauma unit, this is one of the first things that I learned is... In patients with these spinal cord injuries, we don't want to be using sucks. Although, if it's within the first 24 hours of their injury, we haven't had that time to be able to have that upregulation take place. And so oftentimes you will initially still see succicoline being given to these patients initially following their injury. And so oftentimes, and sometimes out of an abundance of caution, we'll often just avoid sucks in these patients. Finally, with sucks, it is important to know that these patients are also at risk for malignant hyperthermia. All right, so that pretty much covers our depolarizing agents, aka our only agent, sucks, which is a great medication in a lot of cases in which we need it, but there definitely are some, some serious potential effects of this medication. All right, so now let's move on and talk about our non-depolarizing agents. Now, when we talk about our non-depolarizing agents, there's actually two classes here within this, one that we call our aminosteroids, and the other which we call benzylisoquinolinium. Yes, that actually is the name, and for the rest of this lesson, I'm just going to refer to this one as our benzyl. But the medication in these classes are a little bit different from one another. Primarily, though, when we talk about these medications, we're usually going to categorize them based on their length of action. And when we talk about these, we're dealing with short-acting, intermediate-acting, and long-acting. Now, from our depolarizing agents, succinylcholine is going to be one of our short-acting agents. But within our class of non-depolarizing agents, there's not actually any short-acting agents that we use. And so then, let's go ahead and take a look at our intermediate-acting drugs. So now there's a few different drugs in here that we're going to talk about within this category, and so let's divide this up into our amino steroids and our benzyls. In fact, you'll see here within this non-depolarizing class, the vast majority of the paralytics that we use are going to be one of these intermediate acting drugs. And so the first one that we're going to talk about here is a medication called rocuronium, or you might see it also called zemuron. Now, of all these medications, this one has the shortest onset of about one to three minutes but it does have a fairly long duration of anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes dose dependent. Because of its pretty quick onset and its somewhat short duration, 
this is a really good alternative for RSI or rapid sequence intubation. And in fact, you're going to see this one given pretty frequently for this purpose. In fact, I'm sure we can all hear someone yelling out for 50 of rock right now. Now, when it comes to giving rock uranium, we can use it as a drip, but it's not very common. Typically, it's going to be IV push. And our dose for this is usually 0.6 milligrams per kilogram. If you do see it as a continuous infusion, though, our dose usually is in the range of 0.6 to 0.9 milligrams per kilogram per hour. All right, so let's move on and talk about another amino steroid. This is one that we call Vecuronium, or you'll also see it referred to as Norcuron. Now, Vecuronium, or Vec, this one has a medium onset of about 3 to 4 minutes, but it actually has a shorter duration than Rocuronium, with a duration of about 35 to 45 minutes. Now, this medication, though, is six times as potent as Rocuronium. Now, again, with this medication, this one is going to be more common as an IV push, but we will sometimes see this as a continuous infusion. And so our bolus dose for this medication, we're usually giving it at 0.1 milligram per kilogram. And if you see it as a continuous infusion, your dose is going to be in the range of usually 0.05 to 0.1 milligram per kilogram per hour. All right, so those are our two amino steroids here in this intermediate acting group. Let's go ahead and talk about a couple of our benzyls. The first one is a medication called atricurium. This medication has a medium onset, again, of about 3 to 4 minutes. And similarly to Vecuronium, this one has a duration of about 35 to 45 minutes. One of the great advantages to this medication is it's a really good option for our patients who have some sort of liver or kidney disease. And so the reason for this is these benzyls, there's actually a complex process within our plasma that's actually responsible for the metabolism of these medications. But as a result, temperature and our patient's pH can have an impact on this metabolism. Now, one important thing with atricurium is that this medication can actually cause a histamine release. And so sometimes in these patients, we would see hypotension, tachycardia, and flushing, but that it's not an anaphylaxis reaction. And so because of this reaction, and in all honesty, in the past, it was a pretty common occurrence, we really don't use this medication often, particularly for this reason. So it does kind of segue nicely into our other benzyl that we're going to talk about, that this one came after atricurium, and this is one that we call cis-atricurium, or also goes by the name Nimbex. So just like atricurium, this medication is a really good option for patients with the liver or kidney disease, because again, it's going to be metabolized in the plasma, so that temperature and pH are going to play a role in its metabolism. But unlike atricurium, the dose that's required to see this histamine release is so high that we just don't see it. And so it served as a really great replacement for atricurium, which was a good option. Like I said, for a lot of these patients, a lot of these really sick patients that we're dealing with are having issues with their liver or kidney. And so this is one of the most common drips that we're going to use in a continuous infusion. Now, this one does have a long onset of 5 to 7 minutes and also has a duration of about 35 to 45 minutes. We can give this as a bolus, and if we do, the dose is 0.15 milligrams per kilogram. And our continuous infusion dose is usually going to be from 0.15 to 0.2 milligrams per kilogram per hour. All right, so those are our different intermediate acting drugs. Of all of these, the one that you're probably more often going to see as a continuous infusion is going to be that cisatricurium or the Nimbex. So finally, let's move on and talk about our long-acting medications. And here, there's actually only one medication that you're going to commonly come across, and this is a medication called pancuronium or pavulon. Now, this medication is an amino steroid. This one has a medium onset of 2 to 4 minutes but a pretty long duration of anywhere from 60 to 120 minutes. So definitely the longest out of all of these medications. This one does have what we refer to as a vagolytic effect, which can impair our vagal stimulation and thus leading to tachycardia in our patients. Now we can give this one as a bolus dose, and usually that dose is going to range from 0.04 to 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. But this is also another one that you may see as a continuous infusion, and that dose is usually ranging from 0.6 to 
to 0.1 milligrams per kilogram per hour. All right, so that's going to finish up our discussion here talking about the non-depolarizing agents and really conclude this lesson talking about our different medications that we use for neuromuscular blockage. Lots of very different medications working in very different ways, but when it comes to the continuous infusions, the common ones that you're going to see are the cisatricurium or the Nimbex or the pancuronium or pavulon. Some of the others you can come across, but they certainly aren't very common. And so with all that said, I do want to thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, leave us a like or leave us a comment and let us know. Make sure and look us up on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter if you haven't already. And if you did like this video, hopefully we earned a subscription from you, which you can do down below. Make sure and keep an eye out for the next lesson in this series, or feel free to watch another one of our great video lessons right here. As always, thank you so much for watching. You guys have a great day.